This is our final session in Isaiah chapter 53, or strictly speaking, Isaiah 52, 53. So I'm just going to read this morning from verse 7 of Isaiah 53, and it would be good if you follow this along, uh, because we'll be working quite closely with the text this morning. So Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished." He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So that's what we're going to concentrate on this morning. <clears throat> the final two stanzas of this magnificent passage, this prophecy concerning Jehovah's suffering servant. Now, I would suggest to you that in verses 7 to 9, we're listening to Jehovah, the Lord God himself, speaking once again. You'll remember how we hear the restored nation speak, and then Jehovah, and there's this exchange goes on. But it's clearly the Lord himself who is speaking in these verses 7 to 9. And I'm going to draw your attention to three things. Jehovah's servant was perfectly obedient to the point of death. That's verse 7 and the first part of verse 8. Secondly, Jehovah's servant was completely misunderstood in his death. That's the remainder of verse 8. And then thirdly, Jehovah's servant was unexpectedly honored after his death. And that's verse 9. So we'll start with the first of those. Jehovah's servant was perfectly obedient to the point of death itself. We're told he was oppressed and afflicted. That is, he was treated unsparingly. It's the idea that no one held back. And yet, at no point did Jehovah's servant speak a word to resist the injustice, to protest at the abuse, or to deviate from God's plan. And twice we read the phrase, he did not open his mouth. And this is exactly what we see borne out when we come to the gospel accounts in the New Testament. Jesus remained silent, we're told, before the high priest. Matthew 26, verse 63. 
he remained silent. Quote, before the Sanhedrin, Mark 14, verse 61. He gave no answer when the Jewish leaders accused him before Pilate, Matthew 27, verse 12. He gave him no answer when interrogated by Herod, Luke 23, verse 9. He gave Pilate no answer when asked where he was from. As a lamb led to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is dumb. We know how difficult it is to suffer in silence, don't we? And yet how much more difficult it is to suffer unjustly and in silence. And remember what the prophet says here. It was by oppression and judgment that the servant was taken away. That is, it was through an oppressive judicial sentence. You see, Jesus' death was both a terrible miscarriage of justice and also a case of state-sanctioned murder. And yet, in obedience to the Lord and for the purposes of redemption, Jesus gave his silent yes to that injustice and chose to die a death He did not deserve. What perfect obedience we see in Jesus, Jehovah's servant. But even as we admire the beauty of our Savior in this, which is right to do. But let's hear how the Apostle Peter applies the truth of Jesus' non-retaliation in the face of unjust suffering. Hear how Peter takes that reality and applies it to the followers of Jesus, to us. This is 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23. To this you were called. And he has been writing about suffering unjustly. To this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself To him who judges justly. So let's ask ourselves. Are we people who must always be vindicated? Who are quick to retaliate? Who trade in accusations and tit for tat when wronged? Christ's non-retaliation... And confidence in God's justice is not just something that we are to admire. It is something that is to be reproduced in our own lives. We are to follow his example and walk in his footsteps. Secondly, Jehovah's servant was completely misunderstood in his death. I want to read you what is an increasingly favored translation of verse 8. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, that he was punished for the transgression of my people? And Jehovah is emphasizing the ignorance 
that surrounded his servant in his death and the extreme isolation that he experienced in it. Who of his generation was at his side supporting him, sympathizing with him, understanding why he had to die as he did? And the answer, of course, is no one. Think about it. The representatives of religious and political power conspired together to put him to death. He was betrayed by one of his close companions. His three closest disciples fell asleep in his hour of need. All his disciples deserted him when it came to the crunch. The ordinary people turned their back on him and cried out for his crucifixion. As you read the gospel accounts, it appears that all that Jesus was left with was a a group of, a small group of powerless, broken, and confused women who witnessed his cutting off from the land of the living. What moral strength Jesus possessed. He was completely devoid of human succor. Let me quote you from another of Isaiah's servant songs. This is Isaiah 50 verses 6 and 7. The servant is speaking. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be put to shame. Jesus knew what none of his contemporaries understood. He had to be cut off from the land of the living and to be stricken for the transgression of Jehovah's people. And though he faced that sin-bearing death alone, he knew that God would vindicate him and that he would not ultimately be put to shame. Thirdly, Jehovah's servant was unexpectedly honored after his death. Verse 9. We don't tend to think too often about the burial of Jesus, but it clearly mattered to Jehovah. And verse 9 makes Fascinating reading. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. What a riddle that must have been to ancient readers. Not so us living on the other side of Christ's death. It was undoubtedly the intention of Christ's contemporaries to continue their humiliation of him in death and have him buried in a common criminal's grave, probably the Valley of Hinnom, which functioned as Jerusalem's garbage dump. But as soon as Jehovah's innocent servant Submitted to death. The time of his humiliation and dishonor was past. We know what happened next. I'm going to read this to you from Matthew 27, verse 57 to 60. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had become a disciple of Jesus. 
Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away, buried in the tomb of a rich man. Assigned a grave with the rich, overturning the plans of the wicked. But this is only the beginning of the honoring of Jehovah's servant. For the Lord then will not allow his Holy One to see corruption. And on the third day, he will be raised triumphant over death and will thereafter ascend to the very throne of God. In these verses 7 to 9, Jehovah will have us consider the death of his servant to see the beauty of him who spoke not one word against human injustice and divine justice which met together at the cross. To see the strength of him who went to the cross with none but his father at his side. And to see the honor given to him from the very moment in which his suffering ended. What can we say other than hallelujah? What a savior. We have a few moments left to consider our final stanza. Verses 10 to 12. And I suggest to you that in these verses we hear the nation speaking again, the restored nation of Israel in that day to come. We hear them speak for a final time in verse 10. And then in verse 11, Jehovah brings his concluding words. Verses 11 and 12. <coughs> and both the nation and Jehovah speak about the same thing. They speak of the servant's sacrifice and the results flowing from it. These verses focus our attention on the servant's sufferings at Jehovah's own hand. Remember what we were thinking about earlier as we broke bread. His suffering at Jehovah's hand. And the reward that he then receives from Jehovah as a result of his suffering. This is holy ground. Remove your shoes, brothers and sisters. Can you hear the astonishment with which verse 10 begins? This beautiful one who was so ill-treated. We read this, yet, notwithstanding his utter perfection, it was the Lord's will to do three things to his servant. To crush him. To cause him to suffer. And to make his life an offering for sin or for guilt. He suffered in his holy soul, verse 11 tells us. He bore the sin of many. He carried the sin of many, verse 12. <coughs> Let me say again, this is our God. This is what he did for us. This is our Savior. This is what he endured for us. But please don't miss the personal results for both Jehovah and his servant. 
What we have in the final phrase of verse 10 is my favorite phrase in all of the Bible. What is the result for God for all that he inflicted upon his servant, which his servant willingly endured? What is the result? It's this. And the will of the Lord, Jehovah, will prosper in his hand, in the servant's hand. Are you getting this, folks? The will of the Lord will prosper in the servant's hand. How magnificent. All God's purposes will reach their glorious end for they are held in his servant's glorified and nail-pierced hand. Not a single aspect of all that God has purposed will fail. None of it. For it depends entirely upon the risen and exalted Christ. Hallelujah. And how I am reminded of that heavenly scene described in Revelation chapter 5 when the Apostle John, poor John, were told he weeps and he weeps because no one was found worthy to take the scroll from the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. No one was found worthy to open the scroll and bring to fulfillment the plans of God. But John is told to cease from his crying for the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. And though he looks like a lamb that has been slain, he stands at the center of the throne and he takes the scroll. From the hand of him who sits on the throne. And as the lamb, the lion lamb takes the scroll. All heaven erupts in praise. Because there is one who is worthy to bring all God's plans to completion. <clears throat> Do you ever doubt that it's all going to go exactly where the Bible tells us you need to look at the servant's hand because it's in his hand that all God's purposes now rest. Not on you and not on me and not on anyone else but purely on Jehovah's servant. And right now he sits on the throne. And what of Christ himself Jehovah's servant who endured such unimaginable sufferings. What beautiful words we read as we finish our time in Isaiah's magnificent prophecy. Here's the personal results for Jesus. Verse 10, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Verse 11, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life or the fruit of his suffering and be satisfied. Verse 12, Jehovah says, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great or among the many, and he will divide the spoils with the strong or with the numerous. What we have here is the resurrection and exaltation of Christ and the personal satisfaction that he enjoys already 
on the other side of his suffering. We say it with bowed hearts and bated breath. His delight is found in those for whom he made intercession, whose sin he bore, and whom he justified before God. So let's finish there, because that's where Jehovah leaves us. All of us who have received Christ, who are trusting in the work of Jehovah's servant on our behalf, can we see ourselves as his reward? Can we sense something of the delight and joy that Christ finds in his people? And where does that leave us? Are we left thinking we must be some catch if Christ takes such delight in us? We know the truth. And knowing who we are and what we are, there's only one way we can respond. What a God we have. There is none like you. Hallelujah. What a Savior.